Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for you, as usual. And, Jim, today is State of the Union Day, and so we pretty much know what the president's going to say because we've heard him say it a couple different times at the State of the Union and in many, many speeches in the intervening time. But one of the things we know he's going to touch on, regardless of how exactly he terms it, is this idea of, income inequality and we have to raise the minimum wage and we got to make sure there are other ways that if you work hard then you can afford everything you want basically one of the things that a lot of conservatives are trying to point out is that the president's notion of the amount of wealth in the country and in the world isn't exactly accurate and ben stein on the o'reilly factor recently may have summed it up well they were discussing a story that suggested the 85 wealthiest people in the world controlled the same amount of money as the poorest, $3.5 billion. And here's how Stein explained why that's not necessarily the worst thing ever. It's always been true that a very tiny majority of the richest people in the world controlled an enormously disproportionate amount of the wealth, and the poorest people controlled a very, very tiny portion of the wealth. But, you know, the the way the media's been playing this is as if there's a finite amount of money in the world, and if the rich people have a lot, then the poor people have less. But that's not the way it works out. If the rich people got rich by starting businesses, starting new technologies that gave more employment, more productivity, more wealth to the other people, then everybody gets richer. There's not a finite pool. Rich people getting rich does not make poor people poor. Garrity? Garrity? (laughs) Ben Stein, to his great credit, will forever be associated with Bueller. Bueller. (laughs) Worth noting about that statistic they're arguing about, Kevin Williamson did a fantastic job of just dismantling it, pointing out that it's just flat out not true that the numbers are totally off, because if that were the case of, of 85 richest people in the world to have the same amount of money as you know, $3 billion on the bottom, you would have to have a trillionaire. We don't have any trillion. We have billionaires. We have people who have quite a few billion dollars to their names, but not even the Sultan of Brunei, not even Bill Gates, not even Carlos Slim. None of those guys have a trillion dollars. And when you add up the total net worth of everybody on Earth, you'd need some of those 85 million to be trillionaires to come to that level. By the way, global poverty actually has gone down quite considerably in the last you know, 30, 40 years thanks to the spread of free markets and capitalism and entrepreneurship and things like that. So words really have a hard time expressing how much I'm dreading watching the State of the Union. These speeches are really tough to make interesting and fun to watch and, and you know, worthy of discussion in the best of circumstances. These are not the best of circumstances. Apparently tomorrow afternoon I'll be on some heritage panel with Tony Katz and Kurt Schlichter dissecting the State of the Union. And Greg, I'm just asking myself, why did I agree to do that? Because to do it, I have to watch it. And yes, we kind of predict all the class warfare stuff and you know blame the rich people stuff that we're going to get from the president. A lot of it's predictable, but you know, just in case Joe Wilson gets antsy <laughs> or there's some other unexpected development, just in case Obama calls on people for the public stoning of the Supreme Court justices he doesn't like or something like that. Whatever rabble rousing you know he does there, we got to watch. The good news is this is a very tired song. Basically, it's been played by the left for for decades and generations. And I think enough Americans realize that making the rich guy poorer doesn't necessarily help them out. When Americans look at Steve Jobs, Occupy Wall Street held a moment of silence for him and applauded everything he did, even though he was an unbelievably rich guy. The issue is not really income inequality. The issue is can you get ahead in life? Can you prosper? Can you rise up uh, in in life? And a lot of folks feel like they can't. And that's kind of a separate discussion from how do we punish these darn rich people? And, uh, you know, maybe someday we'll get the president to kind of wake up to this sort of stuff. But the expectation is that right for now, the easiest option is to uh, just find a scapegoat and demonize them and, you know, ride that hopefully to victory in the midterms. Uh, Jim, it's probably easy to expect that for the most part what the president wants to do with these income inequality policies and so forth the mainstream media is going to champion, and for the most part, Democrats in Congress are going to champion. Do you think there's any chance that he's going to potentially hamstring the next nominee of his party, whether it's Hillary Clinton or somebody else, by rallying support for principles that that nominee knows uh, ultimately isn't going to be a winning message in 2016? For better or for worse, the Democrats are getting better at all kind of binding themselves together and, and basically saying that they realizing that they all rise or fall together, that Ultimately, if Obama is seen as a failed president, it's going to make things harder for Hillary. 
I'm the fresh face who's going to shake up Washington, you know. And for that matter, congressional Democrats, you know, as much as Obama may occasionally try to triangulate or run against Congress in general, ultimately, if Obama's doing badly, congressional Democrats will suffer as well. The major super PAC, Priorities USA, that, that backed Obama and ran like 80-some million dollars worth of negative ads against Romney in 2012, has already declared that they're, they're endorsing Hillary. So whether we know it or not, Greg, the Democratic primary for 2016 is over. That, that <laughs> super PAC, with its millions of dollars, basically picked the nominee. Speaking of Hillary, she was at the, I believe, the North American Auto Show in Detroit. And interestingly, she was being interviewed about a number of issues, uh, one of which was, would you have any do-overs as uh, Secretary of State? And here's what she had to say about that. My biggest you know, regret is what happened in Benghazi. Uh, it was a terrible tragedy, uh, be- losing four Americans to uh, diplomats, and now it's public, so I can say to CIA operatives, losing an ambassador like Chris Stevens, who was one of our very best and had served in Libya and across the Middle East and spoke Arabic. I think a lot of folks, uh, Jim, are glad to see that, that she would put that at the top of the list, but they're still waiting for admission of uh, things that should have been done differently, not just regret that it happened. You know, Greg, first of all, why do people find her charismatic? I mean, just, just listening to the audio of that, I'm reminded of the teacher in the old Peanuts cartoons, wah, 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 wah. And she's talking about, you know, one of the most serious and consequential terrorist attacks on Americans in, in the past, you know, 10 years. Here she is, and it, it sounds like she's reading off the farm report or mortgage rates or something like that. And so the idea that there's this love for her out there that I think is much more about the idea of Hillary, I am woman, hear me roar, you know, much more than actually who Hillary is. Just as I said earlier, that some of her friends genuinely believe she's going to be able to run as the Pope Francis of America, somebody who's going to come in and clean up Washington and be this dynamic, charismatic reformer. Um, but then the second thing there where she's talking about, she doesn't, you know, like she says she regrets it, but there's nothing about, well, what do you wish you'd done differently? Like, is it the memo saying we needed more security? Is she saying she wished they had had be able to mobilize some of the military forces in Europe that may or may not have gotten there in time, but there's no indication that they actually got off the ground? Is she saying that she regrets the spin coming from the administration? Is she regretting what allegedly she said to the parents of the victims of that attack? You know, there's, there's a lot of room for what Hillary could be, you know, taking responsibility for and admitting there. But we're, we're getting these bland, mushy, mashed potato clouds of words that don't really tell us anything. Just an observation there that, you know, Hillary was not known for having spectacular access to the press during her 2008 presidential campaign. She certainly didn't like to do contentious interviews. And we saw just last year one of her buddies, Terry McAuliffe, take this to a new level of just not doing any interview that could be remotely hostile during the campaign, you know, much more contained environment. I think we're going to get this. So we're never going to get the equivalent of a Tim Russert interview on Hillary of, of, about Benghazi. We're never going to get Britt Hume. We're never going to get Chris Wallace or Jake Tapper or even a Chuck Todd really going toe-to-toe and saying, what happened that night? When were you told? What did you say to people? Taking us through every step of the, uh, of the decision-making process to figure out when she says regrets, well, what do you regret? Instead, you're just kind of like, oh, I wish it hadn't happened, which isn't really taking much responsibility for anything. And I I have a suspicion that if you really pushed Hillary on this, she'd say that she isn't responsibility for it, which is kind of a remarkable stance to take from an alleged, you know, from somebody who was our secretary of state. We'll see if Hillary can get through the entire 2016 cycle without really addressing a hardball interview. I don't mean a Chris Matthews hardball interview. (laughs) I mean a genuine hardball interview on these sorts of topics. My guess is she'll just try to glide it over. And the spin will be that when she starts running in 2016, oh, we've been talking about this for so long. Oh, this was way back in 2012. I can't believe we're still talking about this. It was actually really, you know, Clinton, Clintonian scandal stuff 101, which was delay answers, delay answers, delay answers, and then say, oh, we've been dealing with this thing forever. Interesting stagecraft there. I don't know exactly what the acronym stands for, but above where they were interviewing Hillary Clinton was a big four-letter banner that said N-A-D-A, NADA. Uh, (laughs) And so you have to wonder if conservatives will use that to explain what she should be proud of from her time as Secretary of State. I don't know. What answers has Hillary Clinton given us? NADA. That's what. (laughs) All right. Quickly on to the crazy martini now. When California pharmacist Kevin Kingma received a letter last fall notifying him that his high-deductible health plan was being canceled because of the Affordable Care Act, 
He logged into his state's health insurance exchange and chose another plan beginning January 1st. Thanks to a subsidy, his monthly premium went down from about 300 to 175 and his benefits improved. But this month, Kingman logged into his bank's website and saw that his old insurer, Anthem Blue Cross, had deducted $587 in change from his account and had enrolled him in another of its insurance products for this year, he says, without permission. What happened is, when they received letters last fall, Kingma and others, about their cancellation, they were informed that their plans had been canceled. But within the letter, it also said that if they did nothing, they would be switched over to a different plan. And if they had set up their payment to auto-draft from their account, it would continue to do so. He says he just didn't read that far down into the letter, Jim. So this is probably a little bit more about Anthem Blue Cross and people not reading the fine print when they get really bad news like that. But obviously there's a reason why all this started. The good news is this is not happening. As far as we know, this is not happening to thousands and thousands of people. It's only happening to hundreds and hundreds of people, which is you know, <laughs> still a fairly significant problem. Uh, the insurance companies say they're doing their best to straighten it all out and that basically this is a matter of people not really reading their notification letters that closely. But it's still got to be a very rude awakening when all of a sudden, oh, by the way, you're signed up for a new insurance plan and it's more expensive. And oh, by the way, please, you know, we, we've deducted, you know, this, this small fortune from your account. The reason we mention this is the crazy martini besides the, you know, craziness of waking up. Hey, by the way, here's a new insurance plan that you never signed up for. We didn't have to do this, right? We, we could have just as easily enacted any one of a bazillion other conservative reforms in this area, health savings account, tort reform, all that kind of stuff. Instead, people who, who thought they were doing just fine are now all of a sudden having these changes forced upon them and getting the rude awakenings when these changes don't go right. There are many things that are frustrating about our friends on the left, among them the fact that I, you know, good manners requires me to call them our friends on the left. <laughs> Among them is that they always kind of it'll it'll work out. It's going to be fine. And you know, those of us who are are conservative generally look at big, complicated changes and say, no, no, Mr. Murphy always shows up. Things go wrong. <laughs> you know, no, nothing goes quite according to plan. And if you're lucky, the problems are small. Sometimes you're not so lucky. You know, by the way, the website isn't working for the first two months. It's supposed people are supposed to be using it. And you know, our, our friends at the left never seem to get this. They never seem to you know. Put that extra leeway to make the changes gradual and stuff like that. No, it's all big, sweeping, universal reforms. We're going to fix it tomorrow. Let's amortize the eschaton. And then, of course, stuff like this happens. But people get signed up for plans they never signed up for. So yeah, I feel bad for those 500 people. Hopefully they get it straightened out pretty fast. But, you know, I guess the other lesson is read the fine print every single time. Jim? Have a fabulous time watching the State of the Union tonight. I know there's a lot of State of the Union drinking games. That could make your Heritage panel more fun tomorrow if you engage in one of those, but I don't know that they would necessarily have you back if you did that. So I'll leave, I'll leave it up to your judgment. The temptation is always there, Greg. <laughs> Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And join us again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.